Welcome to Hack the Entrepreneur, the show which reveals the fears, habits, and inner battles behind big name entrepreneurs and those on their way to joining them. Now here is your host, John Naster. Hey, hey, this is Hack the Entrepreneur. Thank you so much for joining me again today. We've got a great show, so let's get right into it. I'm your host, John Naster, but you can call me Joni. My guest today is the founder of School Spirit Vending, but he wasn't always an entrepreneur. He spent his first nine years of his career as an Air Force pilot before entering the corporate world. And despite being a top performer, he had always had this long-term desire to start his own business and be his own boss. Yet after a random conversation with a friend about the gumball machines that his friend's family had owned, the seed was planted for what would eventually become School Spirit Vending. School Spirit Vending started with a single gumball machine, now spans the United States with hundreds of locations run by a small army of franchisees. Now, let's hack Matt Miller. Now, let me ask you a question. How many emails do you have in your inbox right now? A hundred? A thousand? Thirteen thousand? If your email is anything like mine used to be, well, then the answer is just too damn many. But here's the thing. Even though I knew I wanted to do something about it, I didn't really know how. I knew I'd miss something important if I just deleted them all. But there were too many emails to go through. So then I finally learned the secret. The secret to reaching inbox zero and finally taking back my email. It's called SaneBox. And I absolutely, 100% recommend it to everyone. SaneBox sorts through your email and moves all the trivial stuff into a different folder so the only messages in your inbox are the ones that you actually want to see. Really, the ones that you actually just need to see. And aside from removing all the junk so you can focus on messages that matter, there's this great feature called Black Hole. Move an email into that folder and you'll never hear from that sender again. It's, it's a good feeling. <laughs> because we could use more organization in our email life, we worked out a great deal for you, our listener. If you visit sanebox.com slash hack today, they're going to throw in an extra $25 credit on top of the two-week free trial. You don't have to enter your credit card unless you decide to buy, so there's really absolutely nothing to lose. Check it out today and let me know if you love the black hole feature and reaching inbox zero as much as I do. Again, that's SaneBox, S-A-N-E-B-O-X dot com slash hack. And you'll get all of this for free and more. We are back with another episode of Hack the Entrepreneur. And today we have a very, very special guest. Matt, welcome to the show. Hey, John. Thanks for having me on, man. This is awesome. Absolutely. Absolutely. My pleasure. I think we're going to have a lot of fun. So what do you say? Should we jump into it? Let's do it. Excellent. Matt, as an entrepreneur, can you tell me what is the one thing that you do that you feel has been the biggest contributor to your successes so far? I'd have to tie two things together, John. I think first off, being fearless is kind of an overarching thing, but Secondly, just the ability to come into a, a line of business or an area and look at it from a complete and total outsider's perspective. I got started in vending as an outsider at the time I was an ad executive and before that I was an Air Force pilot. And because I came in from an outsider, I was the thought process and thinking that many that have been entrenched in that industry forever were held back by. You know, we've done the same thing with the fundraising industry, with what we do inside of schools, and in a lot of ways doing the same thing with in the podcast world as well. So just to kind of come in as an outsider and, and disrupt some things because I don't have the baggage that many others do. Oh, so you use it as an advantage rather than using most people would use that to be their excuse to not enter that marketplace. 
Yeah, I mean, I'll give you a great example. We're a franchise today. My After two and a half years of franchising, I finally went to an International Franchise Association show this last January or February. And, and I intentionally waited because I didn't want to have my vision clouded by what everybody said I should do. I already had my attorney. I already knew what legally I had to do and all that. But once I had established the business and the success of the business, then I went to see if I could do any tweaking instead of having them completely guide and direct my entire thought process from the beginning. Wow. Okay. So, so I can take this as two ways. One thing, I absolutely love the idea of not clouding it and not sort of, otherwise you kind of fall into other people's bad habits, right? It's like your like dad teaching you to drive when he's got terrible habits and then teaches them to you. That same thing can happen with business, <laughs> right. but at the same time, there's, there's a lot, like if you don't have to start from scratch with every aspect of starting a franchise, would that not sort of propel you ahead faster? Or did you use some sort of tools and things that were there as foundations? I read a bunch of books and then of course paid a franchise attorney a ton of money for their expertise. We had kind of done business for about seven and a half years in a pseudo franchise like way anyway we just weren't officially a franchise and so it might have hindered things a little bit but i'll give you great another great example we homeschool our kids and that's completely opposite the way a lot of people do things but my thought process is okay why you know who made the educational establishment experts at what our kids need to know in society today. And so my wife and I decided, you know what, we're going to follow what the requirements are for educating our kids here in Texas. We're going to follow the letter of the law. But there's a lot of things we're going to teach our kids that no other kids are going to get because we think they're important things that they should learn that just don't fit into a typical classroom. So that's another example of kind of the, the thought process in a lot of the way we do things around here. So you, yeah, you like to, I mean, question sort of the rules and the authority of things just because those are the established ways of doing things doesn't necessarily mean that it's true. And so it's so interesting aside to that, we homeschooled our daughter, Matt, and but we're up in Ontario in Canada, and there's actually no rules governing at all what you have to teach a child when you take them out of the school system. That's awesome. Which I didn't actually know until we did it and I sat down with the principal. We did it in grade two. And the principal was just like, no, you can come back in a year. You can come back in five years. It doesn't matter. She'll just go back into the age group she's with and that's it. And it's like, wow, really? You like, do you realize that really sort of undermines what you're teaching here? Right, right. Yeah. So I guess that gives you the perspective of that's how it is. But at two and a half years, you started two and a half years ago, you started franchising, but I mean, you're what, almost 10 years into the business. So that was about seven years into it. Correct. Um, can you kind of take us back to sort of that inception of this idea when you entered the marketplace of vending that you'd never been part of and then sort of take us through to that point of starting to franchise? So I'm formerly an Air Force pilot, became an advertising executive. And because of a lot of decisions that were made corporately at the company that I worked for, I found myself into a really, really bad hole financially about 13 years ago. And I knew looking at the corporate compensation plan that there was no way for me to get out of that hole anytime soon. And that's when I decided I needed to start doing some stuff on my own. Initially, we collected aluminum cans and sold them back. I was an Amazon seller of books on Amazon before selling on Amazon was cool. My garage looked like a library for a number of years just full of used books. But I had read Robert Kiyosaki's book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and had bought into that whole idea of passive income and making money while you sleep. And neither of those things provided passive income. It was just another, you know, trading hours for dollars type scenario. And a buddy of mine from church one Sunday mentioned gumballs and the fact that he and his daughters had a couple of gumball machines. That sparked the idea. I started doing some research rented it or bought a couple books online on Amazon about vending and then set out teaching myself the vending industry just by getting out and doing it and learning as I went. 
fast forward about a year and a half, I had about 125 locations around the Houston area where we lived at the time. I had ventured into toys and temporary tattoos and stickers and that type of thing, aside from the candy and gumballs that I started out with. And right around then, 07 and 08 hit, the market tanked, revenues plummeted, and I was really, really frustrated. And right around that time, I had several kids come knocking on my door, selling me stuff for the local school fundraiser. They were coming to strangers' doors, raising money. And that whole thing just got me thinking about, okay, how could we get kids off the street? Oh, by the way, kids are in school nine months out of the year, five days a week. So if I could figure out how to do vending there, I wouldn't have to worry about the ups and downs of the economy as much. And that's where the whole idea of school spirit vending and custom spirit stickers for the school with their mascot and their colors and all that came from. And I had a buddy of mine who was an elementary PE teacher who gave me a shot or who got me a shot in his elementary school outside of Houston. And man, the testing that we did there, just the numbers were off the charts. And so then it was just a matter of figuring out how to duplicate that idea in schools across Texas and now schools all over the U.S. and soon to be up in Canada. Wow. Wow. So, I mean, both aspects of it. So when you were doing it sort of personally from a friend at church telling you about it, and then all of a sudden 125 vending machines locally, it's like you don't kind of mess around. And from a garage before that (laughs) of used books. So this is kind of like when you see an opportunity, you really tend to just run with it? I am not the guy. I'm the ready, fire, aim guy. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not the ready, aim, fire guy. I'm the ready, fire, aim. In fact, last time we got a grill, you know, like a charcoal grill or barbecue grill for our back patio, we got the thing in and I spent a couple hours trying to figure out how to put it together without reading the instructions. Eventually, my wife came out and read the instructions and helped me get it put together correctly. Even though I wasn't successful on my own without reading the instructions, I learned a lot in that process, though. And so I'm wired to learn by doing. And like I said earlier, don't really have a whole lot of fear of of messing up and, and making mistakes. So we'll jump into the swimming pool and figure it out as we go. That has served us well. We make a lot of mistakes. We fail a lot. But along with a lot of those failures, we're also learning in the process. And that learning and that knowledge added together piece by piece, you know, ultimately will lead to something. And so that's how I learned vending, school fundraising. That's how I've learned podcasting in the last couple of years is, okay, let's jump in. Let's figure it out as we go. and. It's not going to be really good to begin with, but at least I'll be heading in the right direction and we'll figure out the little nuances and all that later. There's always endless stuff to learn. I mean, so if you stand still trying to learn it all, it's never going to end. So you might as well get going. But with 105 franchisees now, two and a half sort of years into franchising, early on, you mentioned how like selling books on Amazon, those kind of things weren't like passive income, like Rich Dad, Poor Dad talks about. So with 105 franchisees, are you telling me that this is like a passive sort of income you're running? It's a lot more passive than what it once was. I mean, nice. you know, I still am actively involved. I host a podcast twice a week for our franchise team. You know, we have mastermind calls that I lead up monthly. You know, there's communications back and forth on Voxer and email and text and all. Though I've been able to build out a team that as we move further and further into this, take on more and more of those roles and responsibilities. That said, if I wanted to take off for a month tomorrow, I could do that. And that's ultimately what I was looking for is the ability to have time freedom and location freedom when I wanted to take it. And so, you know, as an example, my oldest daughter goes to college, back to college here in a couple of weeks. And I'll be at Podcast Movement in Anaheim for a couple of days. My wife has taken my daughter out to Virginia. I'm going to fly out to Nashville to meet her part way. We're going to spend several days together after she drops Sarah off, and then we'll drive home. 
And whatever I need to do, I can do remotely on the computer or or with my phone during that, you know, almost week that I'm away. Nice. I like it. So I like how it sort of stayed a theme throughout all of this is that idea of having that flexibility and time to do what you want, but also grow the business. So you've mentioned podcasting a couple of times and now podcast movement. So you have, to clarify for people, you have sort of a consumer, like public facing podcast. And then you also have this internal podcast for your team, which I find really fascinating. Could you sort of explain how you're using this? Well, for the public facing, what I found after getting out into the the school fundraising space is there was no voice for all the fundraising companies and companies that support schools in and around the country. And so the School Zone podcast has become that voice and it's given them an opportunity to share who they are and for us to dive deeper with those companies so that school volunteers and administrators and, and all that have the opportunity to learn more about these companies instead of just, okay, you know, you're going to make this much money, this percentage, and this is what we sell, which is really all the conversations amount to on the trade show floor oftentimes. As far as the private podcasts, what I've learned is with a decentralized team in about 43 states around the U.S., it's really, really, really difficult to disseminate information effectively and to develop a community type environment throughout the year. We do have an annual conclave where everybody gets together for a long weekend in June every year. But how do you maintain that throughout the year? How do you provide the opportunity to support one another? How do you share best practices and all that? And the podcast has afforded us to do that. I remember a young guy on our team, his parents had been franchisees for a while. He became 18, wanted to become one himself. And he was down in the Miami, Florida area a couple of years ago and just had this incredible story about how he went in and met with a principal. The principal got really excited and ended up leading him to work with another five or six schools, literally, you know, with a few phone calls while he was sitting there in her office. And I was like, man, I've got to share this story with the team. But how do I do that? You know, I could write it down, but, you know, in a couple paragraphs, it's not really going to do it justice. And at that point in time, I decided, you know, I'm listening to a bunch of podcasts. Why don't I start a podcast? That way I can actually interview Jesse and let him tell his story. And people can hear the actual story and what happened instead of me trying to translate it in a way that anybody would get anything out of. So that was kind of the aha moment, I guess, where I realized the value of it. And so we interview our franchisees when they hit certain levels of success. I bring outside experts in to talk about a variety of topics that have direct relation to our team and and what we've got going on. I've got a show every week on Thursday. It's just called SSV Tips. And it's my opportunity for five to 10 minutes to expound either on a topic that is specific to what we're doing in the schools and our and vending, or in many cases, it's just you know success principles and the value of understanding them and the value of thought process and changing thought process to go from point A to point B where we all want to get to. So as somebody who runs franchises now, like you have 105 franchisees, do you see your, your sort of role in the company has obviously changed a lot. The company has changed, I guess, from more of a consumer facing to now franchisee facing. But then do you see as a big role of your company as like the coach or the mentor or the guide through all of this? No doubt. No doubt. My role is not just to shepherd people through learning how to make money with vending and support the schools in their area doing it. I see it as my responsibility to to help our team live a more rounded and complete life and to to better shepherd and coach their families along the way. One of our our first mantra is family is our foundation and our entire business has been built around the families of the members of our team. My kids have been actively involved. My youngest, Rebecca, is just about 16. 
she's been actively involved in vending since she was three. When I started and got my very first candy and gumball machine, and initially she was just putting quarters in the machine, and then she was helping sort product, and then she was assembling machines, my oldest kids as well. And today, many of the life skills that they have developed have a direct role and will have a direct role in whatever career they choose to lead or whatever business that they choose to own and operate. My son was our very first graphic designer at 10 years old (laughs) because graphic design was really expensive when I was starting the company and I realized it was always going to be that way. So I bought the Adobe suite. I bought an iMac and Zane traded a couple hours mowing the lawn of a good friend of mine who was a Hollywood commercial editor and graphic designer in exchange for a couple hours of teaching in Photoshop and Illustrator. And we gave him an environment over the last 10 years to grow into that role. Six months ago, he was called into the office at Hillsdale College, where he goes to school in Hillsdale, Michigan, by the head of external affairs. And the guy was like, so I've seen a bunch of your work around campus. How did you learn how to do all that? And Zane proceeded to tell him the story of how he started at 10 years old in his dad's business. Well, here he is 20, almost 21. He's done thousands of jobs with hundreds of clients. And it's because we just gave him, you know, a place of safety that he could learn and pursue his talents in a way that that hopefully he'll be able to use for the rest of his life. You know, we've done the exact same thing with both of his sisters as well. In fact, my youngest, Rebecca, She loves to talk and she loves people. And she has always wanted to go to the trade shows that dad is working and not initially she just went and ran around and got free stuff from the other, you know, tables and all. Right. But after a while, she wanted to participate in the presentation of our program and the explaining and the selling of it to where the Texas team, our franchise team here actually request her to come and work the events today because as a teenager she is that much more effective with these school administrators etc than us adults are because number one they're floored that a teenager can carry on a coherent conversation but number two she has a unique perspective that they're not getting from all the other companies that they're talking to on the trade show floor well she learned that just by being part and in an environment of entrepreneurship in our family. And we encourage that with all the families on our team so that hopefully those kids can stand on mom and dad's shoulders as they move up into responsible roles in their lives and in their communities and in their families and you know, be that much further ahead. Yeah, I didn't start my first business till I was 28. I didn't start SSV until I was 40. And so my kids and the kids on our team have a huge head start. And we do that with intentionality and as much as as much as we can with what we do. I love it. I love it. It's so it seems like you have a very sort of well-developed environment and sort of like ecosystem for growth amongst your franchisees. Can you take us back, Matt, to like two and a half years ago? How how did you go about like from selling the idea of vending machines to schools to then like selling the idea to your first or maybe your first five or 10 franchisees? Well, we started early on 10 years ago as a distributorship model. So it hasn't just been me since almost the beginning. I had a couple of guys that worked that very first PTA show with me. And slowly but surely, we had others ask, hey, can I be part of what you do as they heard through the grapevine what we were up to? And we set them up as distributors. And then there was a licensing agreement from the beginning. So there was a royalty involved, et cetera. But to be honest, John, I had franchising wasn't even on the radar three years ago, but I hired a coach. And in working with Aaron, got the name of Aaron Walker, Aaron challenged me one day uh, about two and a half years ago, three years ago, and said, you know, Matt, I've been looking 
at the opportunity that there is out there just in the U.S. as far as growth. Do you have any idea how many schools there are out there? And I'm excited what you've done in the last seven and a half years, but it seems to me the only reason why you're not working with all those other schools is they just don't know who you are yet. I would figure out how to go about growing your team so that they can learn who you are. That led me to look at how to better market what we're doing, how to expand the team. I reached out to my attorney and said, hey, what do you recommend? And he said, well, to be honest, to grow in the Northeast, in the Midwest, and out West, areas that typically have a lot more bureaucracy and a lot more government control on things, you really need to be a franchise. So we swallowed that pill, didn't have any reserve to pay the thousands of dollars necessary to make it happen, but figured it out and got that accomplished. So a lot of what we did, John, is very similar to what we did for the prior seven and a half years, except for I now needed to start convincing people that it was worth you know, the cost of admission. And what we found real quickly is there was a lot of people out there who were hungry for a secondary income, but didn't know how to generate one themselves, who were looking to develop income passively, who were looking to support schools in their local area with their business, and who are interested in in starting a business that their kids might possibly be involved in as well. And so we've had people lined up for the last two and a half years. We've added in the last 18 months, 65 franchises. And it's crazy, but what we've done and what we represent has resonated with a lot of people out there. and, And we've been blessed. We really have. And you've taken the action, but you said something interesting there, which was Aaron Walker. Your coach, yeah, yes. he was on the show like two and a half years ago, maybe. Awesome. And so I will link to that. But so I had made the assumption because from your very first answer, Matt, you're sort of like that ability to come into things without knowing with the outside perspective. I took that to assume that you don't use coaches or sort of mentors in that way, but you've become one to all of your franchise and your team, which is amazing. But then you mentioned Aaron. So is that the first time you've used sort of a business coach or is this something that's been a part of your sort of journey? No, that's the first time. I, I got to a point about three, three and a half years ago where I realized that I had kind of stagnated and I knew that the speed of the group is determined by the speed of the leader. And I needed to continue to grow mentally and get myself around people that would make me uncomfortable and that I could learn from. So I started attending some events and all that. and. At a Dave Ramsey Entree Leadership event three and a half years ago, I ran into Aaron, who was there as a guest of Dave's because he and Dave are great friends. We got to know each other during that week. And when I got done, I was like, man, I've got to find a way to get around this guy. You know, 35 years of business experience, multi, multi, multi millionaire, bought and sold at the time, you know, eight different businesses along the way. And I realized that I needed some outside perspective in what I was doing and some encouragement and some accountability in my life. So that's where hiring him came about. Since then, I'm involved in a mastermind group as part of View from the Top, which is Aaron's company, et cetera. And I essentially have an informal board of directors through that group of men that I have the ability to learn and float ideas by and ask questions of on a regular basis. Now, what makes it unique is they come from all business backgrounds and all walks of life. So it's not like I'm masterminding with a group of franchise owners (laughs) or or I'm masterminding with a group of, of school fundraising vendors. You know, I'm talking to working with people that Everybody has a completely different perspective. None of them have perspective in specifically what I do. There is power in that, though, because you don't get caught up in groupthink and in one way of thinking just because everybody comes from the same place. None of us come from anything even remotely close to the same place. Yeah, I love that. And so the mastermind was put together from view for the top, view from the top, you said? Correct. Okay. And then what's like, just people will be fascinated to kind of dive into the mastermind a bit. Like how many people are in it? Like when, how often do you get together and do you have sort of a strict format? We get together weekly. 
It's an hour long Zoom video conference every week at the same time, same day. We have a basic agenda that we follow throughout. We're always in the process of reading a book every month. There's an, another book that's everyone is encouraged to read. So part of the conversation is just discussing what's going on in the book that we're reading. But then we have something we call man in the middle and we rotate through that role. And every week, one of the guys has about 30 minutes of that hour to ask questions, to, to kind of, you know, lay themselves bare as far as, okay, guys, this is what's going on here. What would you recommend? How would you handle this? I'm thinking about doing this. What do you think? And our 100% focus for that 30 minutes is on them, their business or their life and what they're going through. It's powerful, powerful. The insights that I've gotten from the guys, the perspectives that I've gotten over the last two and a half, three years have been huge because once again, I only look at the world through the lenses that I've been blessed with and my own experiences. And since they all have un a unique lens and unique experiences, they always cast or they always have questions or thoughts that I would never even think of just because I'm not wired that way and, and have never experienced anything like that before. Yeah. And especially from completely different like markets and perspectives, is it, or was it scary the first time somebody from a completely different marketplace of yours gave you like an idea of like how you should sort of pitch something or go towards something without, you know, that thinking of just like, you just don't get the vending machine business. <laughs> um, well, you know what I mean? Like, cause it's yeah. true. Business is business to a certain degree, but we all feel like our business is different than everybody else's. Yeah, I think so. And there's, there's still some times where I walk away saying, you know, I, I I'm grateful for the, the feedback that I got, but, but these guys don't quite get it or, or their comments or recommendations don't quite apply, but more times than not, they have been right on the money. And I've just, needed to look at things a little differently. The hardest part, I think, to begin with is early on, we didn't know one another. So it took us a while to get to know one another, to realize that the environment was a safe environment, that you know nothing that we discussed was going to leave that discussion, and to kind of lay ourselves bare over time to be transparent with one another. And a lot of it's business, but you know, there's been times where, where we end up talking about some pretty deep stuff, you know, about life or about our faith or, or you name it. And I, I, and I love the fact that it's not just about the dollars and cents and the businesses that we're running, but that, you know, it's bigger than that. It's more than that because, you know, our lives are more than just the businesses that we run. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, Matt, this has been an absolute uh, blast. I would like to wrap up on one final question for you, if I could. Sure. It's this idea I'm working with calling the entrepreneurial gap. It seems to be this gap. I've talked to hundreds of entrepreneurs now, but this gap that we live in as entrepreneurs, as dreamers, no matter what we accomplish personally, it seems that we always see our, our own personal success is projected into the future, never at this time right now. So in three months when you land your next group of franchisees, or in six months when you get to stand on that stage, whatever it happens to be, you and I both know, Matt, that seconds before you hit that goal, you're going to set five or 10 bigger ones into the future, <laughs> which like walking towards the horizon, the further you walk, the further away it always gets. I would love it. You've been through a ton. So I would love it if you could stop looking forward right now and stop and turn around and look behind you at this whole journey from Air Force pilot all the way through almost 10 years of building a really, really, really impressive business. But look at the highs, the lows, the wins and the losses, and tell me how you feel about the journey until today. A lot of the journey, John, has really sucked. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, and I don't mean that necessarily in a negative thing, but the reality is we went through a lot of junk to get where we were. I mean, I got to a point, here I am, quote unquote, former Air Force pilot, America's finest, right? Air Force Academy graduate. I mean, you name it to where I got turned down for a payday loan 13 years ago, which all I needed was a couple hundred bucks to make it to the next payday. You don't even need a credit rating for a payday loan. But 
I had had a bunch of overdrafts in my bank account the month before, and that disqualified me from from a couple hundred bucks. You know, we were at a stage where birthday cake in our household, and we still define it as such today, was a little York peppermint patty with a candle in it because we were hurting so bad financially, we couldn't afford anything else when the kids were growing up. But here's what I know. I know that God had to put me through that stuff so that I would be prepared to do. And if I had not gone through those things, I would not have learned what I needed to learn to be able to empathize and to be able to show people that there is a way out of the situation you're in because I've been there, done that, and got the T-shirt. If I had never been there, it would have been very, very difficult to relate to others, and it would have been very difficult for them to relate to me. So even though the journey stunk in a lot of ways, it was necessary. I Going to school at the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs, the Rocky Mountains were literally right outside our window. And there is nothing that grows at the top of the mountain. All of the growth occurs in the valley. Well, all of the growth in our lives occurs in the valley. And we don't like to be there, but we have to be there if we're going to learn and grow. You know, my story is what it is. I can't take it back. All I can do is be grateful for it and learn and and continue to become what I hope God means for me to become in my life. But I'm grateful through and for the process because I know the guy I used to be and I'm a completely different person because of that today. Excellent answer. Excellent answer. All right, Matt, we've got to talk about your business in passing. Could you now specifically tell the listener about the business who it's for, and then where to find it online? We do passive, hassle-free fundraising for schools. We put sticker machines in schools with custom stickers, and then we end up being an ongoing fundraiser for the school. We are a franchise today, like we mentioned earlier, and we partner with people in local areas around the U.S. and soon to be this fall in Canada as well. And we teach people how to do what we do. They can go to ssvbusiness.com to learn some more basics of what we do. And John, I actually, if you don't mind, I'd love to give a a free giveaway to anybody in your audience who's interested. I wrote a short book called Live Your Dreams, The Top 10 Reasons Why You Need to Own a Vending Business. You can go to ssvbusiness.com forward slash hack the entrepreneur to download that for free. And if you have a desire to talk about the franchise, we can. Otherwise, I have recently released a course on vending, vending secrets to passive income, and you can get some info about that as well, and hopefully open folks' eyes a little bit about the power of vending and how it might benefit them and their families, potentially. Very, very cool. SSVbusiness.com slash hack the entrepreneur will get you that free book. Schoolzonepodcast.com is the podcast that has been mentioned in passing. I will link to those in the show notes for you on Hack the Entrepreneur. Also, I'll track down a link to Rich Dad, Poor Dad, the book. If you haven't read it, I absolutely recommend that you do. And the Aaron Walker episode, as well as a view from the top, I'll track down a link for that as well. Matt, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for taking the time and thanks for sharing so openly. I really do appreciate it. And please just keep doing what you're doing because it is awesome to watch. Hey, John, thanks for being here and and providing me the opportunity and God bless you. If you are ready to reach Inbox Zero, then you are ready for SaneBox. If you go right now to SaneBox.com slash hack, you'll get a 14-day free trial, plus you're going to get an additional exclusive 25% credit applied to your account immediately. Go right now and reach inbox zero with SaneBox, S-A-N-E-B-O-X dot com slash hack. Well, that was a truly fascinating conversation talking to Matt about the where the idea came from for School Spirit Vending and also how he's continued to grow it and scale it around the country. So it was fun. It was a fun conversation to be part of. But we've now reached my favorite part of the show. 
part where we get to go back. Are you ready for it? Let's do it. Let's find the hack. I'll give you great, another great example. We homeschool our kids. And that's completely opposite the way a lot of people do things. But my thought process is, okay, why, you know, who made the educational establishment experts at what our kids need to know in society today? And so my wife and I decided, you know what, we're going to follow what the requirements are for educating our kids here in Texas. We're going to follow the letter of the law. But there's a lot of things we're going to teach our kids that no other kids are going to get because we think they're important things that they should learn that just don't fit into a typical classroom. And that's the hack. Matt, Matt, Matt. I love this. I love this. So, okay, so it's about homeschooling, but it's not about homeschooling. Or is it? <laughs> so we homeschooled my daughter for two years. Um, so I'm not going to get into whether homeschooling is right for your child or not. That's not what this is about at all. But I love the beginning of it where how they homeschooled because they questioned sort of the authority of or who made the experts of the school board and what was to be taught, right? This to me is a really defining characteristic of a lot of us who are creators, who are entrepreneurs. Questioning not just authorities, but the way things have been traditionally done and not just going along with how things are. It's making, that's to me what entrepreneurship is. It's making things how you want them, how you wish to see them in the world. And rather than waiting for them to be like that, you do them yourself. You either create the service you wish existed, you create the product you wish existed, whatever it is, or you create the work environment for you your family, for whoever's around you and involved in your life. It's creating those, that life that you want and pushing forward in those ways. These things that we've been led to believe that are sort of weaknesses or downfalls and we need to get rid of, these are actually sort of like our superpowers that push us forth to do the big things that we need to do, to change things we need to change in order to succeed and to profit. So this idea of how Matt, I love how Matt says this, and he's saying this example as like sort of how he thinks this thinking carries through beyond the education of his child, or not beyond, but is like, it's separate from it. And I mean, the education of your child is an enormous thing. And so I'm not trying to undermine that. I'm just saying that it's not because of that necessarily. It's just those are the choices he's made. He goes on to give a couple of other examples in his life of how he just doesn't follow the rules properly. That's why he's suited to be an entrepreneur. Look for these characteristics and these traits within yourself. And when you find them, nourish them. Don't try and get rid of them. Don't try and undermine them in some way. Nourish them and push them to the forefront of you because these are the characteristics. These are the traits that are going to take you on to conquer and do Big, big things. Matt, thank you so very, very much. All right, Hack the Entrepreneur. If you are struggling to find out what you should be focusing on, when you find this focus, and what it is you should be pushing forth, you need to define your 20. You need to find that 20% of what it is that's going to drive you forth. You need to learn how to pick the next project you should work on, how to break it down and then work on it each day and each week and each month to be able to launch these things that you want to launch. It's a new course. It's very small. A couple of videos, some PDFs, and another ebook that I wrote. And it's called Define Your 20. You can find it at hacktheentrepreneur.com slash DYT for Define Your 20. Or go to Hack the Entrepreneur and you'll track it down. Some other places as well. If you are struggling to find out what to work on, or you know what you want to work on, but you're struggling to just get it done day in, day out, week in, week out, this course was made specifically for you. Go check it out. All right. Enough out of me. This is fun. I am so happy that you stopped by and checked out the show with Matt and myself today. His show notes will be up on the website as well. You can check out over there. Anything we talked about today will be up there. 
Matt's a smart guy doing a lot of smart things. So track him down through Hack the Entrepreneur. If you have any further questions for him, I'm sure he'd be more than happy to help. But yeah, it's been fun. Thank you so very, very much. And please, until next time, keep hacking the entrepreneur. 